Thank you, Phil, and thank you all for coming out today. I know there's a lot of ways you can spend your Friday, so I appreciate you spending at least the next 30, 45 minutes uh, with Steph and I. We've got a lot of cool stuff to talk about today. Uh, the things that you're going to see today you have not seen before because it is all original research. We've gone out, we put some boots on the ground, we've talked to a lot of analysts, done a lot of really cool interviews, and we're going to share the results of that today and release a paper today that we've written along these lines. If you don't know me, my name is Chris Sanders. I run a company called Applied Network Defense. We focus on information security training and research, particularly with investigators. And um, I also run a company called the Rural Technology Fund, where we focus on donating technology equipment and scholarships to kids who are interested in pursuing technical careers. Uh, my background is mostly in defense and education work, uh, but I focus on the, the training and the research and such now. And I've written a couple of books along the way, and those are pictured there. My name is Steph Brand. I am an IT and cybersecurity student here at Augusta University. My background is in clinical psychology. I'm finishing my internship up with Applied Network Defense. And fun Steph fact, I am a former Whitewater Raft Guide. She's at least 20 times more hardcore than me, as evidenced by that picture. Uh, pretty badass. <laughs> So, um, I want you to go ahead real quick, and if you have something, I see a lot of you have your computers open, good. Pull up a notepad document, or maybe get something to write on. We're going to do a little bit of an exercise here, and I want you to be able to write stuff down. It looks like a lot of you are already ready, so that's good. So, we have an investigation scenario. Uh, we have kind of an alert on the screen. And the alert is fairly straightforward, not a lot of details, but the alert is such that you have a system, a Windows system on your network, and... A process called update.exe has launched on that, and that, for whatever reason, is suspicious, maybe just because it is named update.exe and that is quite generic. But that is suspicious and you have to investigate this. So what I want you to do is I'm going to give you two minutes, no more, and I want you to write down a list of the ways you might consider investigating this alert. It can be a series of questions, it can be a series of investigative paths, it can be data sources you want to examine. But take two minutes and write down a list of ways you would investigate this. There are no wrong answers for our purposes here. So you have two minutes to do that. About another minute. Okay. Now again, there are no real wrong answers for our purpose here. We're going to be using this list a few times throughout the talk today, but does anybody want to share with me just maybe one of the items on their list? Not everybody wants to. Let's, let's do hands because everybody, somebody close. Right here. What's the file hash? Okay, sure. Right here. What registry keys? Okay, way in the back. Danny. What process spawned it? Very good. So we got a lot of options here. I imagine a lot of you have things on your list um, that were not said. There's a, a whole lot of ways you could go about that. And I think for many of you, even if you only have a minimal amount of investigative experience, coming up with at least a few items or a few ways you would go about investigating that, not too insanely difficult given this scenario. However, if I were to ask you how you came up with the things on the list, I think that question's quite a bit harder. We're not very good all the time at understanding our own processes. How do we come to the conclusions? What thought modes we're using to think about these complex things? 
and that to some degree is what we're going to talk about today. We interviewed a number of security analysts this summer and when we started asking them some of those questions, how did you decide what you were going to do, how did you decide to proceed in your investigation, this is what one of them had to say. It's hard to put into words, and it is very hard to put into words. Even if you know a process extremely well, it can be very difficult to tell someone how you're doing that process step by step. And if you don't completely understand the process, that makes it even more challenging. Now the analyst workflow can be summed up in a number of different ways, but I think the simplest way to represent that is simply that you have some form of input, often it's something like an alert, and then you work through an investigation, you go out and look at evidence, and you build this timeline of events that have occurred, and that gets you to a specific conclusion, and that kind of encapsulates what we do. Now another way to say this, using a little bit different terminology, is this notion of perception and reality. We form this initial perception of events that have occurred and they're kind of nebulous, all floating around, and we continue to assimilate evidence, add it to that perception, and eventually that forms one cohesive reality of what actually happened, tangible events that have occurred. The top, the alert to conclusion, is what we call the investigation process. There's a name for this perception to reality thing too, uh, and it's one you're all familiar with, it's, it's learning. That is how we learn, and that's how we generally learn anything. So there's something to be said for if we want to understand how we do analysis and how we do investigations, we can learn about that by learning about how we learn. If you understand how you learn, you're gonna understand better your own thought process and how you do investigations. And I particularly think that there's something to that, really. Now, another fancy word for learning is cognition. And a fancier word is metacognition, which is learning about learning, or specifically thinking about thinking. If you want to get better at understanding your own thought processes, you have to be what they say is metacognitively aware. And there are two components of that. One is knowledge of cognition, so knowing how you think about things and how you come to conclusions. And the other is regulation of cognition. So taking those things and then applying them to specific scenarios. And we know that there are all kinds of benefits that come along with that. It makes you a better learner, of course. It makes you a better problem solver. It helps you understand the relationship between not just knowing something, but doing it and applying that knowledge. And this is the key one. It gives you the ability to consciously use specific thought patterns at appropriate times. Because we don't always think the same way in every scenario. Different scenarios call for different forms of thinking. And if you can harness that, that makes you a better analyst. And that goes well beyond investigations, but particularly for our use case here, that certainly applies. Now, a problem with this, however, is that our field in general, and analysts in our field, generally lack this extreme or high level of metacognitive awareness. It's something we really suffer with. One of the studies that took a look at security analysts and how they think was uh, Sundura Muthi, and they had a group of sociologists that went into a SOC and actually embedded themselves in a SOC for 15 months. And this is one of the big takeaways from their study. I'm going to read this for y'all. The profession is so nascent that the how-tos have not been fully realized, even by the people who have the knowledge. The process required to connect the dots is unclear even to analysts. I'm going to read that second part again. The process required to connect the dots is unclear even to analysts. And we heard this reflected in the interviews with our analysts this summer. Here's one example. I can't script what I do. I can't just give a run book to somebody to go, this is what I do, because it's very much in the moment. Here's another example, and this was what one of our analysts had to say at the end of his interview process. It's interesting to think about. Usually this is a process with a lot of shortcuts where you don't necessarily have to systematically think through it. I'm used to the pathways enough that I don't question myself as much as I should. Security analysts know how to do their jobs. They don't know how they know. They just do, which works all right if you have some experience. This is a big problem for new analysts who don't have that foundation of knowledge to fall back on. They don't just know yet. And when experienced analysts are trying to train the new analysts, if all they can say is, I just know how to do it, that makes it much more difficult to train new analysts and bring them up to speed quickly so they can do their jobs effectively faster. So with that in mind, uh, and thinking about this notion of metacognition and being able to apply specific thinking strategies to specific scenarios, 
in my time in the SOC, and I spend a lot of time teaching and consulting in security operations centers, I've been quite a few of them every year, uh, uh, throughout the year, and one of the things I've noticed is this use of divergent and convergent thought that occurs during the security analysis process. So this is something we really sought out to study. So I'll give you a, a bit of a brief primer on what that means when I say divergent and convergent thought, and we have some pretty diagrams here. But in general, divergent thinking is used to solve abstract problems with many possible answers. So you have an initial input and you generate a list of ideas uh, from that to some degree. Some key features of divergent thinking include things like intuition, uh, reflecting and gaining some insight, generating lists of ideas. And Divergent thinking is also generally correlated with creativity, so it's a creative form of thinking. Uh, the exercise we did just a moment ago where I had you create the list of things, that was an exercise in divergent thinking. That required you to use some creative type thinking to come up with that list and coming up with all those options from a single input. That was divergent thinking that you did at that point. Now, the other side of this is convergent thinking. And that's where you have all these lists of options and then you narrow down and pick the one you're going to go with, right? Because you can have all these ideas, but eventually you have to pursue one of them and that is convergent thinking, converging on one thing from lots of potential things. As Chris just mentioned, convergent thinking, some of the key features are assessing idea feasibility and judging ideas based on logic and on fact. So what we're gonna have y'all do now is we're gonna have you use your convergent thinking skills we want you to take a look at the list that you created earlier using your divergent thinking skills. We want you to pick your one single best place to start in this investigation. Just one, that's all you get, you get one first move. So take a couple of moments, look at your list and pick your one best starting point. And once you have your best starting point, I'd love to see some hands and somebody to share right here. Okay, what, losses, what process launched it, which I believe is what Danny said earlier. Great, yeah. Oh. What, path did it run from? what path did it run from? Really good. Up there in the back. What wrote okay, what process wrote it, like wrote it to disk? Very good, right here. Has this ever happened before here? Has it ever mm -hmm. happened before here? Really good, right back here. Yes, sir? Where did it come from and what context comes with that? Very good, so we got a lot of good things here. Really good, um, now of course, notice here that everyone had, a lot of people had a different best first thing. <laughs> so not everybody had the same thing. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? <clears throat> so, divergent and convergent thought are to some degree related as with the exercise we just went through. We went through a divergent exercise where you created all these potential choices from the single input and then based upon that, you then can only pick one to move forward with, so you converge, and that's the first thing you're doing, the highest value thing that you think will get you uh, your best value there. This process can also be called creative problem solving. So as we mentioned, divergent thinking is more closely related to creative thought, but convergent thinking is part of it. And during the creative problem solving process, you cycle between these two different styles of thinking. So in a security investigation, this might look like coming up with a list of potential causes and then assessing how reasonable those causes might be, or coming up with a list of problems, potential or potential solutions, and then deciding which solution is the best one for that situation. Yes, so divergent and convergent thinking are really the things that we're focused on here, and we wanted to explore those and learn more about how analysts use those, how they arrive at that thought, um, what value exist there, so we can then figure out strategies, practical strategies for leveraging that in the SOC environment. So Steph has a science background, she has a, a master's in psychology, if you know me, um, I, I do a, a lot of psychology based investigation work as well. So we set out and let's said, let's science the crap out of this thing. And science the crap out of it we did. So we did a, a somewhat formal research study, a mixed method study where we started with primarily qualitative grounded theory research. And if you're not familiar with qualitative research, it's really focused on human experience. Uh, and so what we did here, you see a screenshot there at the right. We actually went out and interviewed a lot of analysts. They had to meet specific criteria. We interviewed them, we converted that to text, and then we started looking for evidence of themes that are occurring within that text. We analyzed all of these. You see the, um, the little bubbles there on the right are different themes. Those are kind of hard to read. One says low ambiguity tolerance, another one says adaptivity, and the other one says intuition. Those are some of the themes that we were looking at. 
And then once we coded all of these, we started looking for patterns that emerged. So the prevalence of certain themes, certain things occurring in certain orders, uh, the lack of certain themes in particular cases, to try to build theory of how divergent and convergent thought are used in the investigative process. And that can be alert analysis, malware reverse engineering, uh, intel-based analysis. It's somewhat universal, we believe, in that regard. But uh, we, we explored across those different dynamics to build this theory that we're going to talk about here in a moment. We're going to tell you all a little bit more about the structure of our research study before we get into the results. We had 16 participants this summer. Four were women and 12 were men. We wanted to get the most complete picture that we could of what different kinds of investigators might do during their investigations. So we tried to get a range of different investigative job roles. We also tried to get a very wide range of experience in the field. We had two different kinds of measures to help us take a look at the data that we gathered. We had both quantitative and we had qualitative measures. I'm going to talk about the quantitative measures first. We gave three assessments to our analysts. The first was very simple. We asked them to rate their skill level on a one to three point scale, whether they felt themselves to be beginners, intermediate analysts, or experts. Chris also ranked our analysts on a numeric scale. We combined those two numbers together, and that gave us our first quantitative measure, which was the primary skill score. We used that score to organize our analysts into three different skill groups, beginner, intermediate, and expert. Our second quantitative measure was one that we wrote ourselves and called the Analyst Skill Inventory. The analyst skill inventory was a series of questions and self-report where uh, analysts could tell us their level of comfort with different tools, with different kinds of um, evidence, and also uh, kind of report their own investigative behavior. Our last quantitative measure was the metacognitive awareness inventory, which was previously existing, and just gave us a way to score analysts' metacognitive awareness. On the qualitative side, Chris already mentioned this a little bit. I'm just going to kind of give you the brief overview. We went into the literature and found as many different traits and behaviors as we could that were correlated with divergent and convergent thinking. We grouped those traits together into groups that we very cleverly called group traits categories. And that gave us something that we could observe and score analysts' behaviors during the interview, and analysts wouldn't necessarily need to be aware of the kinds of thinking they were engaging in without, uh, we could still have an, a window into analyst thinking and whether they were using a divergent or a convergent thinking process. Are y'all excited? Yeah? Y'all should get excited because we're going to start talking about results. We had one major quantitative finding, which is what I'm going to share with you first. So here we have the metacognitive awareness inventories for the three separate skill groups. The numbers that you see there are averages for the groups overall, and larger numbers are better. Larger numbers mean that the analysts believe themselves to have higher levels of metacognitive awareness. As you can see, the beginner group believe themselves to have a higher level of metacognitive awareness than the expert analysts. This is an example of something called the Dunning-Kruger effect. The Dunning-Kruger effect is not exclusive to cybersecurity. It's across disciplines. The hallmark of the Dunning-Kruger effect is overconfidence in one's skills, particularly for beginners. Those with lower skill levels tend to overestimate their own level of skill, and experts tend to more accurately evaluate where they're at as far as skill levels go. And this is interesting to us because it's one example of how analysts might not necessarily be metacognitively aware. And it's super cool because we, we talk about Dunning-Kruger a lot and a lot of people blog about it and things like that, but actual data to show it is pretty cool and it can be cited and all that good stuff. Now, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the qualitative findings, uh, which is really our main goal. Again, we were trying to build theory, build a model of how analysts use divergent and convergent thought and where that emerged. And this is the model that resulted. It's, it's a little bit of a mouthful. It's called the Ambiguity Driven Convergence Model, or ADC model for short. Um, I'm going to go into each one of these things a little bit more individually, but the general idea is that most analysts do not start 
at divergent and convergent thought. Not to say that it doesn't happen, but generally it doesn't. Most analysts start by relying on their intuition. And most of us have a sense of what intuition is. We're going to talk about it a little more here in a moment. But they rely on their intuition, and they are driven away from that intuition when a couple things happen. One is when a high-stakes scenario occurs. We'll talk about what those are. And the other is in the presence of an analyst who has a trait, which is low ambiguity tolerance. When those two things happen, that's when people start doing the things like we did in our exercise. Creating lists, thinking lots of different options, and then picking one to go from. So people don't generally start with divergent and convergent thought, but they get there, and they get there usually from intuition. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about intuition and exactly what that means. Again, intuition is a divergent thought process, and one of the definitions I found that I liked the best was that intuition is a vague perception that points work in a promising direction. Intuition is not based on logic or deliberate thinking. It's based on prior knowledge and on feelings. We saw analysts use their intuition at the beginning of scenarios and at the beginning of their investigations. When we asked them how they decided to proceed, how they decided to start their investigations, these are some of the responses that we got. So I would say I usually start with the first thing that comes to mind and then table all the others. Another response, I just kind of go with my gut. And you know, based on experience, start looking at things. And this was a very common sentiment across our participants. So yeah, there was a lot of going with my gut, which I think is a lot of us how it would describe how we do what we do. And there's some problems with that. Intuition isn't a wholly bad thing. Intuition allows us to make judgments, again, based, like Steph said, based upon our experience. Uh, but the quality of those judgments we found is not always as great as we would hope it would be. So one of the things we did with our, the folks we were interviewing is we went through a series of scenarios. Actually, the scenario we had y'all do at the beginning of this talk was one of them. We did that one and another one, where we had the folks create a list of the things that they would use to investigate, investigative paths, or questions, or data sources. And then we asked them to converge and pick one. The only difference with them is we actually evaluated, not live with them, but later on, we evaluated the quality of their responses. So we could separate out high quality responses from low quality responses. Who was picking the right things to investigate first based upon uh, our collective experience? And we found some pretty interesting things. Now, intuition has a role in divergence, in divergent thinking. If you think back to when you created your list a moment ago, I'm betting for most of you, especially if you have investigative experience, the first few things on your list you didn't even have to think about. You probably just put them down there immediately. But as time went on and you kind of exhausted that initial pool of intuition, then you probably started thinking a little bit more deliberately. What else can I add? What else have I not thought of? And that's when you kind of left intuition a little bit. So the first few things on the list are usually intuitive, the rest of the things are not. And that was interesting relevant to our data because one of the things we found was that of the high quality responses, the good responses that we had, only 10% of them were the first item in folks' lists. So for almost everyone, the first thing they came up with was not the thing that they would end up choosing that is the best way to go about it, which is kind of counterintuitive to what a lot of us think, right? A lot of us think that our first thought would be the best thing. And that, in our experience in, in this data, did not prove to be the case. Now, with that said, the things that people did pick were, of course, on their list that were high quality responses, 95% of them were actually on the list. It just so happened most of them were actually in the last half of the list. So it was when folks were moving away from intuitive thought towards more deliberate thinking that they were picking better quality responses. They were picking the better choices of how to investigate things. Uh, again, intuition isn't bad, but it can be dangerous, and we have to think about that in the things uh, that we're doing. So again, the model we found that folks generally start with intuition and then they are pushed away from it. So how are they pushed away from it and more towards divergent and convergent thinking? Well, there's two factors here. One of them is a trait and one of them is a situation. The trait is called low ambiguity tolerance. And you heard me mention that earlier. Of all the traits that we measured in our qualitative research, this is the one we measured the most in analysts. And the general idea here, we're defining this as discomfort with unclear meanings and the unknown. And you might think, in some ways, we're actually comfortable with ambiguity because we deal with it a lot. But the truth is, the thing that motivates most analysts that we see is uncomfortableness with ambiguity. Because we have this timeline of events, and we have to make this determination. Did something bad happen? Yes or no. How bad was it? We're only figuring that out if we build out a thorough timeline that we're happy with. If there are big gaps in it, we are very uncomfortable with that. So when we say low ambiguity tolerance, that's what we're talking about. Uncomfortableness with the unknown and not knowing, being afraid to miss things 
in our investigation, which I think is something most of us can relate to. So that's a trait that we find generally in, in most of the analysts that we deal with. Um, this wasn't the type of research where we can say, you know, does the analyst profession draw in people who naturally have this, or is it something that's developed when you, while you're in practice of being an analyst? Um, I would guess probably a little bit of both, but that's not what we study here. We just found evidence of it amongst all the analysts we were deal, dealing with um, to quite, a, quite an extreme level. So that's a trait that's present in analysts. It, it exists in most of us to some degree. And then there are, are situations that pull us away from intuition. And these situations are actually a category of situations which we define as high stakes situations. A high stakes situation is any situation which has the potential to increase your anxiety based upon the potential outcome. In our data set, we found three categories of this. One are unfamiliar and vague scenarios. So dealing with things that you haven't dealt with or seen before, maybe um, a, a new alert that you've never seen, a new detection tool, maybe a data type or a system type that you've not dealt with before, that would certainly increase a little bit of anxiety and be a little bit more high stakes, make you doubt yourself a little bit more. Another are investigative roadblocks. So when maybe you've exhausted all the questions you know to ask or all the places you know to look, maybe you suspect there's certainly something malicious going on, but you can't quite figure out how to prove or disprove that that's the case, that would be an investigative roadblock. And the final high stakes scenario are any really social scenarios. That is often when you're having to take your own results and findings and share them with your peers, maybe teammates who are doing, working on the same investigation, or maybe your boss, or maybe putting things into a ticketing system, something like that. But anything social where you haven't shared that information can raise anxiety and can essentially become a high stakes scenario. So these are all things where they kind of force you to be a little bit more thoughtful about your findings and, and really want to try to prove those out to yourself and others a little bit more. So when these two things happen, that's what generally pulls you away from intuition and pushes you towards divergent and convergent thoughts. And we had some quotes from the folks we interviewed related to that. Uh, one analyst said that it's easy to get focused on one thing and get hung up on that. And then I'm always like, well, let's take a step back or go for a walk and take your mind off of it for a little bit. For me, that works, where I'll just go for a walk and think about other things. Another analyst said, later on, I may reflect on it and be like, you know what? If you just have walked away, gone downstairs and had a coffee and come back, you may have thought of a completely different way to handle this. A lot of the analysts we talked to spoke of physical separation, if not just mental separation, but actual physical separation from the issue because it allowed them to stop clicking on things, stop typing on those things, think things through, move away from intuition, apply more deliberate thought, come up with all these lists of options so that when they sit back down at the keyboard, they pick the one they want to go with, divergence to convergence. That's what we're seeing with the model. So the model, again, basically describes that process where you start with intuition and the combined trait of low beauty tolerance with the situation that is high stakes leads folks to this notion of divergent and convergent thought. And that was one of our primary findings uh, from the research. All right, let's get excited again because we're going to talk about how to apply some of this and deliberately leverage divergent and convergent thinking to improve your investigative process. So step one. Start with an investigation input. This could be an input from a current investigation, something like a piece of malware or an alert. It can also be something from a previous investigation. You can do this for practice. It doesn't have to be as part of a current ongoing investigation. Step two, make a list of investigative paths. But this is starting to sound a little bit familiar for y'all who are here with us today. So sit down and actually write down a list of different ideas. Write down all the questions you can think of to ask. Write down different evidence to look into. Write down different timeline scenarios to prove out. But sit down and actually write this out. This is an important part of engaging your different kinds of thinking. So type it up, write it out. And then the last step, after you've done that, take a few moments and pick your best path. Pick the option that you think will give you the most bang for your buck in the investigation. This is not only a great way to help your current investigations, but if you do this as practice over time, your own intuition will get better. It will get stronger. And those items, those high quality items, will move farther and farther up your list. This is also a wonderful thing to do with your team. So maybe once a week or once a month, get everybody together sit down at a table, go through this process together, come up with a list, come up with your best investigative options. This is great for your experienced analysts. It's also wonderful for the new analysts because they get to hear how some of these thought processes work. They get to learn some new ideas.
The crazy thing about this is we're asking you to do this deliberate, deliberately because we think it will improve the quality of your analysis. You're already doing it subconsciously. That's kind of what we found. You're already doing this. So by asking you to take this and bring it kind of into conscious thought, that's that metacognitive awareness. It's not just knowing how you think, it's regulating it, applying these specific thought styles, deliberately practicing the craft to get better at it. Intuition's sometimes a good thing, but we also want to strengthen it while decreasing our reliance on it. And this type of activity works really well. It's not super time consuming. We did a small version of it within the bounds of this talk. You can spend 15, 20, maybe 30 minutes max on it in a group setting. I recommend once a week. I worked with a number of socks who are now doing some version of this, and it's dramatically increasing uh, how the rate at which new analysts are accumulating experience and dramatically affecting the accuracy of the expert analysts and how they're approaching things in a consistent basis. It's pretty cool. Now, the other part of this, uh, kind of a practical takeaway, is that if you do this, and if you do this over and over and over again, uh, and over and over and over again with all these different sorts of alerts, you'll start to notice trends emerge, right? You'll notice you're asking the same questions related to some alerts versus some others. And there are different categories of alerts that you may have. And if you do this over and over and over again, and you write all this down, and then you rank those things, what have you developed? Playbook. It's a playbook. Right? That's a super useful thing. Um, again, it helps teach the new analyst how to, do, how to do the job. Now, you don't just hand them the playbook and say, do this. You hand it to them, let them start picking the way they want to approach it, make sure they're asking why they're doing the things they do and have folks who can tell them why or point them to that direction where they can learn why. And then you're developing new analysts at a, at a particularly useful rate. And again, you're more experienced analysts. This brings some consistency to them. It makes it to where they're not forgetting things that you might otherwise forget, because some of these playbooks can be quite long, uh, 20, 30, 40 items in some cases. I know many of you may have developed pretty long lists in just the two minutes I gave you for that one individual scenario. So the idea is you keep doing this over and over, and you spot these trends. You may find you have a playbook for DNS-based alerts or phishing-based alerts, exploit kits. You categorize these things and focus on your most common alerts or the most common scenarios that you're investigating in the SOC. And by doing the thing that Steph talked about, you're inherently already doing most of the work for your playbook development. Um, the trick is just writing it down um, and putting it in a shared accessible place, which can be pretty darn useful. We'd like to note that, just like all of the research, our study does have some limitations. First of all, qualitative research is not meant to prove things, it's exploratory. It's meant to find new ideas and new themes that can be researched in more detail later. And that's what some of these concepts need. They need more in-depth research, specifically on these different ideas. Our sample was limited. Our sample was based on English-speaking, US-based analysts. And the metacognitive awareness piece, and specifically the lack of metacognitive awareness piece, could have affected the validity of our results. Steph talked a little bit earlier about the quantitative measures we used. Uh, we had to develop some of our own. One of those was the analyst skill inventory. Uh, this is probably because there are not any uh, psychometrically validated, proven ways to uh, evaluate analyst skill. Um, that's something we'd like to hope to move towards eventually. Ours is flawed. It's far from perfect. That would be its own study in itself to continue to work on that, which is something we hope to do. Um, you see, those are the five factors we base the analyst skill inventory on. We hope to improve that over time so it is a little bit more valid, but it's a little bit limited in our case because, again, there isn't one that exists out there. We really struggled with particularly how to weight the different factors and figure out how they would uh, in factor into different analyst investigations. That, that waiting portion was extremely difficult. And in the immortal words of Tom Petty, sometimes waiting is the hardest part. <laughs> now, <laughs> um, so that, that's actually it. That's, that's the short version of our findings. Uh, and normally we'd stop and take questions, but I'm actually not going to take any questions today. Uh, but I have a really good reason. Um, we actually wrote all this up. I know this is a little bit of a novel concept sometimes at security conferences. We actually wrote a paper on this. Um, and the paper is being released uh, uh, today, actually right now. There's the link right there. Um, it's free to download. You don't even have to put in your email address. It's, it's free to all. Um, there's this whole notion in our field that um, a lot of folks are afraid of academic research. They, um, they open up the document and they see that it's formatted in two columns, immediately recognize it's academic, and they turn it off and go away. Uh, <laughs> I understand we didn't put it in two-column format for that specific reason. Uh, but there's value to academic-like research. Our, our research isn't 100% uh, perfectly academic, but it's academic-like and in that style and in that vein. Uh, and there's, certain, there's value I've found in, again, becoming more metacognitively aware, learning how to do the job better, because ultimately investigative work is learning. 
It is the same thing. So if we understand how we learn, we increase that metacognitive awareness, we all become better at our jobs, it helps new folks become better at their jobs, it makes entryway into the profession a lot easier, and that's something that I think is on all of us to do to continue to develop and hone the craft. So, with that said, thank you all for coming out. We appreciate the time. Thank you so much. So, uh, this is unrelated to the talk. This is kind of something different. Perfect. So, um, how many of you were at Security Engine Con last year? So quite a few. You had a good time? Yeah? Yeah? So the folks at Security Con do a fantastic job of this conference. And one of the reasons I think they do that is because they care so much about it. Um, I was actually with, uh, with my good friend Phil here. Um, uh, about a couple months ago, we were teaching a class up in Detroit, and he was asking me, he was like, well, Chris, you know, you, you know, what do you think of Security Engine? What can we do to make it better? And one of the things that I was thinking about was, you know, if you remember at this time last year, um, right before the morning break, uh, Phil got up and was talking. He was like, okay, if you want to go upstairs where there's a nice area to talk and, and uh, mingle, and there's some Security Onion banners up there. And you could take your picture at the Security Onion banner. Um, and what we found was everybody kind of rushed up there to do it, and particularly everyone wanted to take their picture with none other than, than Head Onion Doug Burks over here. Um, what we found, however, was that there's only so much of Doug to go around, and there was basically almost a riot to get your picture made with Doug. Um, so we wanted to, to do something about this. So, so fortunately, about, I don't know, two or three years ago, Doug um, ha had a th media thing he was doing where he had to have this picture made. And I think I actually told him at the time, this picture will come back to haunt you. And um, <laughs> it officially has. <laughs> so we will be uh, carrying this up to the top for the break, which Phil's going to talk about here in a moment. And you all be able to take your picture with, um, if you can't get real Doug, then fake Doug is now here as well. Yeah, and I'm going to be the first, actually, so. <laughs> oh, okay, get in here. Yeah. This is, there's too many ducks. 